Welcome back to Simplifying Synthesis. In this video, we are going to look at the total synthesis of bipolamine I. This work was published in JAX by Zhang Zhu and Joshua Pierce. Bipolamine I was first reported in 2020 by Dai et al. and it was discovered during their research into the biosynthesis of curvulamine an antibacterial compound isolated from the curvularia fungus. Bipolamine I was not naturally present in these fungal extracts, however genome mining identified a silent gene cluster that when activated in bipolaris medis led to the production of the bipolamine family of compounds. Bipolamine I is quite an interesting target as it has a densely functionalised pentacyclic framework with seven contiguous stereocenters and two electron-rich pyrrole groups. This pyrrole electron density could be harnessed to form one of the rings through a conjugate addition reaction. The stereochemistry for this addition could be templated by first installing the bridging ether through an acetylization and deoxygenation sequence. The precursor to this could be stereoselectively synthesized using a metal catalyzed aminoallylation reaction. The synthesis started with the isomerization of an alkyne using potassium terp-butoxide. This first deprotonates the alkyne and the anion can then isomerize, forming an allene together with the migration of a hydrogen atom. A further hydrogen migration can then occur, forming an allene species with a negative charge now residing on the carbon adjacent to the pyrrole. This allene can then isomerize to form an alkyne, this time forming the internal alkyne with a terminal methyl group. This alkyne was required for the aminoallylation reaction. The active catalyst for this reaction is formed from the reaction of a ruthenium hydride complex with diisopropyl phosphine ferrocene. This displaces two of the triphenylphosphine ligands to form the ruthenium chelate. This catalyst first reacts with the alkyne, isomerizing it to an allene. It then reacts with the other coupling partner and oxidizes the hydroxyl group to an aldehyde together with the elimination of hydrogen gas. The catalyst can then add to the allene, forming a carbon ruthenium bond together with the transfer of a hydride. The aldehyde can then displace the labile triphenylphosphine ligand and this adopts a conformation where the hydrogen of the aldehyde group interacts with the halide found in the axial position of the ruthenium complex. With both substrates now bound to the catalyst, the addition can occur. A bond is formed between the alkene and the aldehyde while a beta hydride elimination also occurs, breaking the carbon ruthenium bond and forming a terminal alkene. This formed the product in a 68% yield with a 4 to 1 DR. This stereochemical preference can be attributed to a difference in reactivity of the different conformations of the ruthenium complex. The reaction occurs much faster when there is an E relationship between the carbon ruthenium bond and the carbon carbon double bond. The alkene formed by this amino allylation then took part in an alkene metathesis reaction. Grubb's second generation catalyst first reacts with one of the alkenes and undergoes a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition forming a 4-membered cyclic intermediate. This undergoes a cycloreversion to eliminate styrene and form the activated catalyst where one carbon forms a double bond to the ruthenium centre. An intramolecular 2 plus 2 cycloaddition can then occur forming a 4-membered cyclic intermediate that then undergoes a cycloreversion eliminating ethene and completing the formation of the 7-membered ring. The TBS group was then deprotected using TBAF with a 59% yield achieved over two steps. In the next step of the synthesis, the researchers discovered a rather unusual oxidative cyclization during attempts to oxidize the allylic alcohol. Reaction of the compound with manganese dioxide first abstracted a hydrogen radical from the position alpha to the hydroxyl group. Further oxidation generates a cation that is likely stabilized by the electron-rich pyrrole. Intramolecular attack of the hydroxyl group can then occur, forming a pyran. The hydroxyl group is then oxidized by the manganese dioxide, which first coordinates to it, making it more electrophilic and allowing for the abstraction of a hydrogen radical. Homolytic cleavage of the oxygen-manganese bond completes the oxidation to form the enone. This enone then underwent a spontaneous pyrrole addition, where the enone is attacked by the two position of the pyrrole to form a new carbon-carbon bond and a 67% yield. This addition only occurred from the top face of the ring as it is guided 
by the stereochemistry of the tertiary carbon in the seven-membered ring, and further reinforced by the rigidity introduced by the bridging ether. Neither the allylic oxidation nor the pyrrole addition occurs in substrates that lack the bridging ether, indicating that the oxidation and ether formation occurs first in the reaction. Taking this compound forward, it then took part in an aldol addition reaction. Deprotonation of the alpha position with lithium HMDS formed an enolate that then added to acetaldehyde to form an alcohol. This only occurred on one face of the ring as steric hindrance blocked the concave side of the molecule. We can explain the stereochemistry of the resulting hydroxyl group by looking at the transition state for the enolate addition. Both the oxygen of the enolate and the aldehyde coordinate to the lithium cation, forming a chair-like transition state. The more sterically demanding substituents occupy the pseudo-equatorial positions of this chair in order to minimise 1,3-diaxial interactions. This transition state is much lower in energy than that required to form the other isomer. The newly formed hydroxyl group was then protected with TBS chloride to prevent it from reacting in the deoxygenation steps. While the bridging ether that formed during the manganese oxidation proved to be quite useful in templating the later reactions, it was formed in the wrong position. To install the correct connectivity for the final product, the researchers carried out a reduction acetylization sequence. Reacting the compound with samarium 2 iodide first reduces the carbonyl group and forms a radical on the carbon centre. This is reduced once more, forming an anion. This breaks the carbon-oxygen bond and forms an enolate which is protonated by water present in the reaction mixture. The resulting enol can tautomerize to form the more stable ketone. This is then attacked by the oxygen that was previously present as the ether. This then forms a hemiacetal in a 95% yield. Taking this forward, this oxygen was then reacted to form a thiocarbonate group in preparation for a Barton-McCombie deoxygenation. Phenylchlorothioformate reacts with DMAP to form an activated thioester, which is more electrophilic than the chlorinated compound. The hemiacetal is deprotonated by potassium HMDS and the alkoxide attacks this activated species, forming the thiocarbonate in a 61% yield. This was then taken forward to the deoxygenation reaction. The compound is dissolved in degas THF and it is then reacted with tributyl tin hydride and triethyl borane. Once these are mixed, a syringe full of air is introduced to initiate the reaction. The oxygen that is introduced by this step reacts with the triethyl borane, forming a peroxy intermediate and an ethyl radical. This radical reacts with the tributyl tin hydride to form ethane and produce the tin radical necessary for the reaction. This adds to the thiocarbonate, forming a carbon-centred radical that is stabilised by the three heteroatoms adjacent to it. Cleavage of the carbon-oxygen bond then occurs to form a carbonyl and leave a radical residing on the carbon of the substrate. This reacts with another equivalent of tributyl tin hydride to reform the tin radical and produce the target deoxygenated compound. This was then deprotected with TBAF to complete the synthesis of bipolamine I. Well that's it for this synthesis. Join me in the next video where we will look at the total synthesis of spirochancellite A and B.